I'm Alex Michelson. This week, the issue is the fight over LGBTQ rights. Chastin Buttigieg is here. His new book aimed at making young gay people feel safe and seen. Then, the issue is the border post Title 42. Bill Malusian just back from Texas here in studio as the issue is starts right now. Broadcasting across California, you're watching The Issue Is. And welcome to The Issue Is. I'm Alex Michelson. As the fight over gay rights dominates so many discussions across the country, we've got one of the leading voices right here in our studio. Back in 2019, we first met Chastin Buttigieg. Let's show you him on the cover of Time Magazine back then uh, as his husband, Pete Buttigieg, ran for president. They had that big title there, First Family. Well, in September of 2020, he joined us here on The Issue Is to talk about his memoir, I've Got Something to Tell You, which became a New York Times bestseller. Well, now he has rewritten it with the focus on young adults as his audience, and it is out now. Chastin Buttigieg, welcome back to The Issue Is. Good Thanks to so see much. you. Thanks for being here, and uh, congrats on the new book and on the old book. All right, we got them both. I read them both. They're both really well done. Nice. Um, why was it important for you to do a second version? Yeah, this, this book is the book I wish I would have had in eighth grade. I wanted to write the book I wish I could go back in time and hand to my younger self. There's so, so many things that I couldn't put in the first book. Uh, you know, I started writing that two years ago. I did not think that it would come out during this season of politics. Right. Um, but as things started changing, I was thinking about what do young people need to hear right now? And also, what book could teachers and parents use to empathize with what young people might be going through? Well, and you actually include some photos, which we have uh -oh. of you back then uh, when you were one of <laughs> oh, those yeah. uh, young people. And we love the haircut, very nicely <laughs> done. Those are some of your uh, medals there. There's the minivan. Uh, so, Talk to us about your journey back then. Um, when did you as a young person know, I, I think I'm gay? Well, for a while I thought, uh, you know, well, I didn't have the language for it. So I thought I was the only person in the world maybe feeling that way. I didn't have the vocabulary for all of those feelings going on inside. It was third, fourth grade when I knew something was up. Really? Um, yeah, and then about the time I was nine years old, uh, that's when Matthew Shepard happened. Uh, and then some alarms went off. Uh, you know, I was a gay I, person who was killed uh, yes. in a, in a and, you know, horrible Matthew, homophobic attack. One of and it was politicized, and it, you know, it was all over the country. Um, and you know, Matthew Shepard was taken in a pickup truck, and he was tied to a fence post and left for dead. And I was growing up in northern rural conservative Michigan, around a lot of pickup trucks and fence posts. And that's when I started learning the words to describe what I was feeling, and not only coming into that understanding of who I was, but if the world finds out, you know, everything that I was hearing from my 4-H group, my church, and then on the news, was that, you know, you will lose everything, people won't love you, people think it's wrong, and you might die. And you were afraid to tell your parents, and, and one yeah. of your sort of regrets now is you wish that you would have told them earlier, because once you did, you felt love back from them. I did receive love back from them after I ran away from home after I came out when I was 18. And, you know, lucky me, there was a rainbow at the end of that story, pun intended. Yes. <laughs> uh, but my, my parents called me back home. They, they loved their son more than the fear of raising a gay son. Uh, I just wish that we had grown up in a time when it was okay to have those conversations. And I have been talking on this book tour nonstop about how important it is that parents have that conversation with their kids when they're young. You know, we love you unconditionally. Whether you're gay, straight, bi, trans, whoever you are, you'll always have a roof over your head and parents who love you. Yeah, and not only just parents, but like for people that are experiencing that process of coming out and people want to be allies, but maybe they don't know what to say when somebody says, I'm gay. It's like, what, what's your advice for people of, of what they should say in that moment? Oh, if someone comes out to you, the first thing you should say is thank you for sharing that with me. Because if somebody has decided that you are a safe person to tell that information to, that means you've done something right as a parent, as a teacher, or as a friend. And so understand that that person might be going through so much. Uh, they, they might be afraid, terrified that they'll lose you as a friend. I remember coming out to my friends and, you know, I lost some friends uh, and it strengthened my other friendships. But the number one thing I just wanted to hear was, that's great. Thank you for sharing that with me. I love you just the same. You are a father now. We've yeah. got some great pictures of your very <laughs> cute kids uh, a, as well. Uh, we see them there with, with your husband. And I know when you were writing this, you had in mind them. 
that they would one day read this book. Yeah. What do you want them to know about you from this? Yeah, I, I was a year into writing this and then the twins were born and it really just brought the mission of the book into focus. What I want, wanted them to know that I will love them unconditionally and I want to be there to watch them blossom into whoever they are going to become. I hope that one day my kids will ask me why it was so important to write a book like this. Why were we fighting over simple things like equality, you know, marriage, families. Uh, so hopefully one day it becomes irrelevant to them. But I hope they're comforted by the words that are in it. Well, I mean, it's interesting because when it comes to gay rights, it, it seems like we were on a path of going in one direction and now maybe we're going the other direction. Because yeah. you look at, for example, the fight over same-sex marriage, which was one of the most successful recent political movements in decades. Yeah. 2008, here in California, California voters said no to gay marriage. By 2015, it's legal all across the country. What do you think that trans people who seem to be the most at risk right now can learn from the success of the gay marriage movement? Well, I would flip that and say that many people who were part of, you know, the marriage equality movement now need to learn from the trans community about what they need and how they can be better allies. Of course, we have achieved progress in the LGBTQ community. When I was a kid, I never thought I'd get to wear this wedding ring. I certainly never thought I was going to become a dad. And I think many of the people who are in positions of power or who have seen, you know, more rights come into it, come into their life than, uh, you know, for example, our trans friends. Um, it's now our turn to listen and to do the advocacy and the work because you can't put all that work on the shoulders of trans Americans. So for me, just as a, you know, a gay man, I don't know what it's like to be a transgender American. So I sit down, I close my mouth and I turn my listening ears on like yeah. we used to say in, in classroom. And I, and I try to learn how I can be the best advocate and ally for trans Americans. But I think it starts with listening. Well, and let's talk about that, that book tour. We've got a, a graphic of, of you going all around the country, including to some of these red states yeah. where this is really an issue and a lot of people are feeling very vulnerable right now. Mm -hmm. um, it, what are people saying to you? Uh, this is some of the spots where you're going across the country. <laughs> what are people vulnerable. saying to you? Uh, I am hearing from a lot of people uh, the exhaustion and the fear of what is going on in politics and the frustration that it does seem like those in elected office and positions of power aren't focused on real world issues, especially gun violence. Uh, and as a former teacher myself, I can empathize with the feeling that these people go to work and the thing that they're really upset about are drag queens. And the fact that you know some really vulnerable kids in our country might need access to life-saving care. Um, when you have an entire generation of kids who have gone through school in this country, some of them seeing their friends hauled out of school in body bags. Mm. Generation lockdown, we call it. An entire generation of kids who went through school, going to school every day, wondering if that might be their last. Why are we not focused on that? If that data doesn't scare you into action, and the fact that 40% of the kids sleeping on the street tonight identify as LGBTQ, and one in two trans kids in this country will attempt to take their life. Mm. If all of that data doesn't scare you as an elected official into doing the right thing and being on the right side of history. And instead you are emboldened to go to work and continue attacking vulnerable people. That's shameful. Yeah, and, and you describe it as the three C's, which is yeah. why these trans issues are. What are those three C's? Yeah, clout, clicks, and cash. It's so easy to go on, on social media or the floor of the United States House and say something ridiculous, audition for late night TV, go there, say something ridiculous, send out the email, raise money off of it. It certainly has brought people into higher positions of power within the Republican Party. They raise a lot of money off of that hate and divisiveness. Uh, and, it's, and it's a lot of clickbait for them. Push people to their podcasts, push people to their websites, but it's so far removed from what people need them to be focused on right now. And we're talking about kids. We're talking about vulnerable mm -hmm. kids. And so I would hope that they would be empowered to slow down and listen and invite people to the table, learn from families, learn from teachers, and learn from professionals in their field about what it is actually like to be not only an LGBTQ person, but especially a trans person in this country. That is such a serious and important discussion. We're gonna end with something fun though, because we do like to play some games on this show. Okay. And this is called the name game. Uh -oh. And so these are people that you know, okay. and it's the first word that comes to mind uh, or short phrase, okay? Oh no. You ready? All right. Uh, you put me on the spot last time on the yes. show and I was very bad at it. Yes, Secretary of Transportation, Pete Buttigieg. Uh, Hardworking. First Lady of the United States, Jill Biden. Oh, 
um, an extremely loving, loving. Second gentleman of the United States, Doug Emhoff. Uh, only one word? You can do a few if you uh, want. Dad vibes. He's got great dad vibes. <laughs> uh, former Vice President, Mike Pence. Mm, lost. Beyonce. Ugh, queen. <laughs> and finally. <laughs> Can't get tickets still, yeah, by the way, Beyonce, yeah. if you're listening. Finally, Harry Potter. Oh, old school. Uh, I got that. I got that analogy a lot in, in school. Yeah. <laughs> it's the round glasses. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know you love Harry Potter, right? Uh, yeah, and so, I did when I was a kid, obsessed. Yeah, uh, so we're going to go to break with a tribute to that love. Bill <laughs> Malusian talking the border when we come back. But first, some music from Harry Potter just for Chastin Buttigieg. What a send -off. Thanks for coming on. Really appreciate Thanks. it. Thanks. Good Important to see you again. Stuff. And this is the Harry Potter theme that we go to break with, bring you back. That takes me back. You got to check out Universal Studios while you're here. I was the first <laughs> kid in line in Traverse City when the first movie came out. Wow. These are images from the U.S. border with Mexico following the ending of Title 42. The big question now, what's next for immigration into our country? No national TV correspondent has followed this issue more closely in recent years than Bill Malusian of the Fox News Channel. Bill, just back from Texas, joining us here in studio. Bill, welcome back to The Issue Is. Good to see you in person and strange to see you in a suit. <laughs> Good to see you. Yeah. Weird to be in a suit. Yeah. All right. So let's start with, you know, for people that don't follow this closely, they hear Title 42, they hear mm -hmm. Title 8, they don't understand necessarily what that is. What was Title 42? What happened to it? So basically, Title 42 was a public health rule that was first invoked by the Trump administration. What it essentially says is because there was a pandemic going on, they can immediately expel people who cross illegally into the country, put them on a bus, and just kick them back to Mexico. It's not a deportation. It's not a flight to Haiti or Honduras. They just put them on a bus, drop them off at a port of entry, and get them out of the country as fast as possible on the idea that they could potentially bring COVID or another sickness into the country. So the COVID emergency is over, Title 42 is now over, and now we have something called Title 8. What is that? So Title 8 is the bedrock of US immigration law. That's what the border was using before Title 42 ever came along. So now it's a longer process. Now when somebody crosses illegally, one of three things can happen. Number one, Border Patrol can release them with a future court date, sometimes years out in advance because the system is so backlogged. They can transfer them to ICE, and then ICE can do one of two things. ICE can deport them, or they can hold them in ICE custody while they figure out what to do if, if they're claiming asylum, that sort of a thing. So there was a lot of thought that when Title 42 went away, there would just be this crazy, mad scramble at the border and everybody would be coming in. And surprisingly, the first few days showed that the border crossings were actually down. What's the situation actually like at the border right now? Yeah, so it's weird. The border did a, a 180 from what everybody thought was gonna happen. The big surge happened before Title 42, the days leading up to it, highest number of illegal crossings ever recorded. 83,000 people in a single week. Just to put that in perspective, that's like a full Dallas Cowboys football stadium crossing the border in a single week. Then Friday at midnight, Title 42 goes away, and it has just been dead since then. Illegal crossings have completely fallen off a cliff. The Biden administration would say that's evidence that they planned well for this. I mean, what do you think is going on? What's that about? I think it's a combination of a lot of things. So number one, the state of Texas did something they've never done before and something that has never been done in U.S. history. They surged a bunch of National Guard troops, troopers, barbed wire, and they started physically blocking people from entering. People were crossing the river and coming up to them. Normally they let them in and hand them off to Border Patrol. This time they said, no, you're not coming in. They blocked them. That's one aspect. Another aspect is now that Title VIII is in place, instead of Title 42 just being the consequences, oh, you're gonna get bounced back to Mexico and you can try to cross again later in the day, now you can actually be deported. If you cross now, you might be on a flight back to Haiti or Honduras or Nicaragua rather than just being bounced back essentially across the river. And if you come back again, you could face criminal charges as well. Yeah, right? it's, it's felony reentry and a potential five-year ban on asylum. So, so many people talk about the border that have never been there and frankly don't know what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. You've spent more time there than just about anybody. What do you think is the biggest misconception in the national dialogue about the border? By far the biggest misconception is that the majority of the people showing up at the border are asylum seekers. Are some of them? Yes, absolutely, I've talked with some of them. But the overwhelming majority of the people showing up are economic migrants coming here to look for a job, or they already have family here in the United States and they're looking to link up with them or reunite them with them because they felt now is the time to cross. I've spoken with countless, hundreds of migrants over the last two years. 
I've talked to maybe 15 people seeking asylum. The rest here for trabajar. They want to work. They, yeah. they will tell you that on camera over and over and over. Uh, on a human level for you, spending so many years there talking to these folks and seeing the desperation on people's eyes every day, um, is there a particular person or image that sticks with you in your heart? Yes, so there, there's two. One, October of 2021, we came across two little girls, two little like five-year-old sisters who had just been sexually assaulted by a coyote who brought them across the border. There were medics all around them. Um, it, that was very difficult to see. Number two is there was a Texas National Guard soldier last March who drowned in the river. He jumped in seeing migrants in the water thinking they were trying to cross over and he jumped in to rescue them. They ended up being drug smugglers and he wow. drowned. Mm -hmm. And there's a memorial to him right next to the side of the river in Eagle Pass where we do a lot of live shots. So seeing the American flag and the flowers right there is just kind of a reminder of, you know, so many things have happened over the last two years down there. I mean, regardless of what you think and where you are politically on this, clearly this situation is just sad for a lot of folks. Is there any hope that there's going to be any movement? I mean, what's next when it comes to all of this? Look, in my opinion, both Republicans and Democrats have kind of used immigration as a political football, if you will, bouncing back and forth to criticize each other for going back, what, two decades now at least. Um, they got to get on the same page and come up with something. They're both in their corners right now. They don't want to compromise. House Republicans just put out a pretty strict uh, HR1, a pretty strict border security bill. Democrats aren't a big fan of it. They got to come to the table and they got to find areas where they can legitimately compromise. Both sides have extremes that they want. They got to figure something out because the way it's going right now, look, you've got a lot of people, millions of people showing up who, who want to work. And a lot of people would argue, let's, let's get a legal system for, for that to be able to happen when, when we have a lot of job openings, There's right? a lot of job openings. Yeah. If, if big business can pressure Republicans to maybe do something on this and work with Democrats, that may be the one way that we're able to finally get immigration reform. But there hasn't been real immigration reform in this yeah. country in 40 years. Yeah. All right, on that hopeless note, uh, we want to talk a little bit about you because everybody sees you out at the border and, and you're this serious guy telling serious, important stories. But people may not know this. Bill's one of my best friends. And, and, and we're going to play our game, Personal Issues, where we put 30 seconds on the clock. I don't think you've done this before. No. And I don't even know what you're going to answer to all of these. So let's see, let's see what comes up. All right, Bill, here we go. What is your favorite TV show? Uh, Chernobyl on HBO. In my opinion, that was the best series ever made. Uh, favorite musician or band? Mm. The weekend. <laughs> Favorite sports team? Um, probably Anaheim Angels. Favorite? You said Los Anaheim An Angels. Los Angeles Angels. Favorite? Sorry. Favorite <laughs> first date spot? Uh, wa water Grill in Santa Monica. Uh, favorite way to relax? Gym, beach. And who is your role model? Um, my dad. Why? Tell us about your dad. Uh, he passed away. It's been seven years now and he just pounded work ethic into my head when I was a little kid, stuck with me my whole life, talked to me about discipline, hard work. If you don't work hard, somebody else will. You gotta go and get what you want. And um, just all about personal responsibility and that stuck with me my whole life and it's kind of my work ethic now. So I'll say yes to anything, I'll do anything, I'll take on any assignment. Well, your dad would be so proud of you. Thanks man, appreciate it. I'm so proud of you. And by the way, Water Grill in Santa Monica is a great first date spot. My sister went on her first date with her soon-to-be husband. Engaged. They it. got engaged last week, yes. and they went as part of the engagement process back to Water Grill in Santa Monica. They owe us some money after this. Okay, Bill Belusion, thank you. We go to break with new music from Dave Matthews. This was just released this week. Um, it sounds pretty good. So I, I, who would know you at the weekend? That's an interesting choice. <laughs> uh, we'll be back with more. Uh, Congressman Adam Schiff after this at the WGA picket line. You're watching the issue is. Great job. Thank you. I'm hopeful, and I'm sure that Mr. Schiff is also hopeful that these things can be resolved sooner than later and everybody can get back to work. Actor Scott Bakula joining Congressman and Senate candidate Adam Schiff on the picket lines outside Paramount Pictures in Hollywood. Hollywood's writers have been on strike for nearly three weeks now. Currently, both sides are not at the negotiating table, and no deal is in sight. We caught up with Schiff, who is a screenwriter himself on the side, to talk about his support for this union. They make the magic happen. Uh, without them, it's just static on the screen. Um, 
and they ought to be able to earn a decent living. They should be able to provide for their families. The industry is very profitable, uh, and that needs to be shared among the people who make it possible. And you literally have done screenwriting yourself. So for you, this is really personal. Uh, it is. I've done screenwriting. Uh, my brother David is here. Uh, he is a, a writer, a very successful writer. Um, but these are my constituents. Uh, what they're doing in fighting for fair wages for themselves and their families is the same struggle we're seeing all around the country, whether they're nurses or teachers or firefighters or janitors, uh, deserve to earn a decent living. And as this is Star Trek Day, um, my message to the studios is live long and pay up. As a Trekkie, I agree. Uh, we go to break with the Above Los Angeles page taking us to Above Malibu. We'll be right back. Have you ever met Ron DeSantis or no, talked to him? No. What would I, you say to him? Uh, you know, stop treating, stop being a bully. Stop our thanks to the Los Angeles Press Club for nominating our episode with Governor Newsom in Washington as Outstanding Political Affairs Show of the Year. They also <laughs> nominated our episode from the Summit of Americas for National Political Reporting. Our drive around town with then LA Mayor Eric Garcetti was selected as outstanding profile piece, as was our sit down with sports legend Bob Costas. We're so grateful and humbled by that recognition and thankful for the whole team for making that possible. And we close this week with deep appreciation for someone who's been a key part of that team since we launched five years ago. Pete Wilgorn is leaving us for new professional adventures. He's served us in a variety of roles, always shooting the big shot and helping make possible our most ambitious projects. He's been creative, kind, and supportive, and we will miss him greatly. Thank you, Pete. Our thanks to you as well, and to the Above Los Angeles Instagram page for this shot above Dodger Stadium, and Dave Matthews for his new song, Walk Around the Moon. See you next week. <laughs>